Internal combustion, one of the most commonly misunderstood processes there is. The YouTube troll dickhead, one of the lowest classes of human existence there is. This is a symbiotic marriage of educational opportunity made in heaven. I, double dead dingoes donger, dare you to take the nutbag city limits combustion PhD challenge with me now and discover just how well you know what's really going on down there. And while you're down there, <coughs> think about my cock and his totally platonic need for your support. You can help here. Consider subscribing and support <coughs> the big guy. Now, you know you want this. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where it's your new car buyers save thousands of their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Let us warm up now on our intellectual endurance event with an easy one, okay? So we don't injure our brains by going out too hard. Too early. How about I don't want to live in a place that is smoggy all the time? Or how about does not have an oily sheen on the road due to all the fermented dino dung leaking out? This is the thing dinosaur jizz enthusiasts don't get. It can be about more than just climate change. Ah yes, those well-established fuel precursors, dinosaur jizz and dung. And the underlying enthusiasm of some of us for those things. Such a fine narrative, Adrian. Almost punctuated too, son. Well done. But what a pity that here in the real world, oil, coal and natural gas actually come from the fossilised remains of prehistoric plants. Dinosaur jizz. I kind of like that idea of running the cars on that. Make mine T-Rex premium. Fresh. Crank it, baby. <laughs> Still, this notion is, uh, I guess, somewhat less nutty than those creationist dickheads who think humans and dinosaurs coexisted. The actual gap in time between the last dinosaur and the first human, about 400 million years, problematically. But that doesn't stop the creationist museum showing humans and dinosaurs together. And, of course, some of the dinosaurs have saddles on them because, of course... We rode them. Hydrocarbons, correction, dinosaur jizz and dung are without doubt the most liberating thing that has ever happened to humanity. This is without doubt. The challenge currently is weaning ourselves off them without compromising the access to energy that we all take completely for granted and yet depend upon so profoundly every day. We will need the best minds in the business to get this particular challenge done. And given your grasp of basic science, Adrian, I think it would be somewhat better if you refrained from applying yourself to this task any further. Even if scientists somehow succeed at producing cheap and green hydrogen, we come to problem number two. Millions of cars in a dense city spewing water vapour out of their exhaust pipes. In summer, we'll get constant equatorial climate. In winter, a constant sheet of ice on streets and pavements alike. It takes a special class of moron, indeed, to concoct an absurd hypothesis such as this. Personal opinion. This is a kind of spectacularly uninformed nut job position to take on hydrogen cars, drowning us all in their watery exhausts. Perhaps we should buy Noah some fresh lumber and a power saw. <laughs> Even though that never happened. Except if you're a creationist. What do you think actually happens when you burn gasoline slash petrol? One litre of petrol, that's about 700 grams. Well, it sucks in about nine cubic metres of air and goes boom over and over and over. It actually only needs about 1.9 cubic metres of oxygen gas, but a whole bunch of nitrogen comes in and is just along for the ride because air, that's how it rolls. 
It all burns the oxygen and the gasoline, producing about 1,200 litres of CO2. That's what it would be at one atmosphere and room temperature once it cools down, of course, and about one litre of water if the water were a liquid, but it's really coming out of the exhaust pipe as saturated steam. So about 1,700 litres of saturated steam, or 1.7 cubic metres. So ballpark, one litre of petrol burns and releases one litre of liquid water once it cools down because water is exhaust, hashtag entropy. If you are standing on a busy street and one car per second is passing you by, okay, over an hour or so, near to you, about 250 cubic metres of saturated steam is being pumped out all around you and you're standing in it. This is how this already works. For the year ended 30th of June 2018, we proud former convict assholes burned about 17.5 billion litres with a B of petrol here in Shitsville. And once all that steam cooled down and condensed, we got about 17.5 billion litres of liquid water out of the exhaust pipes. If you wanted to put all of that in a box, you'd need, say, a football field at the base of this box. And the box itself will stretch about 1.8 kilometres into the sky. And I'd suggest that's a pretty big box. More than double the height of the Burj Khalifa. That's the big glass building that Tom Cruise jumped all over so memorably in Mission Impossible ghost protocol. So essentially, pretending that the production of water is going to be a problem if we switch to a hydrogen economy for transport is just spectacularly ignorant of the status quo. We are already drowning in it, I'd suggest. So thank you for your fine comment, Gavalli. Failing to attend school ever has consequences, mate. So step away from the keyboard would be my advice. Engineering Explained has a video showing the amount of fuel burned idling versus being restarted. On his vehicle, I think it takes just seven seconds to burn the amount of fuel used in a restart. So I find your claim that you can idle your vehicle all day for less than the cost of a burger and fries. Total bunk! Dear dipshit, think what you like. I care not, as the facts remain the facts regardless. A modern two-litre engine consumes about 600 millilitres of petrol per hour idling. So here's a thought experiment. Let us park and leave it running and put in a rock-solid 10-hour day for the boss and then return to the car which will have burned six litres of fuel times a buck fifty a litre equals nine bucks. Just for shits and giggles, let us call it ten. Grilled, a popular burger chain here in Shitsville, 125 locations, ass trailer wide, lists a range of dead animal on a bun with various condiments, etc. in its menu. Uh, starting with the so-called simply grilled poverty pack burger for 10 bucks 50 to the $16 nourish and flourish burger. Obviously that's not pertaining to the cow nourishing and flourishing. I'm pretty sure they just fired a steel bolt into its brain and then pureed it, so there's that. Therefore, however, on the basis of economic fundamentals alone, I move for a mistrial, Your Worship, on the grounds that you can idle all day for the cost of a burger, and I don't even know if the fries are extra at grilled. And just so you know, I've instructed my solicitor to file a civil counterclaim that you are a brain-dead asshole in the first degree, Chris. The laws of thermodynamics are not natural laws, but laws written down by a guy as he saw it then. Some of these laws can be bent. Some can be broken. This should be evident when you watch the video and hear the sound of your own voice that it's air say and not something that you actually believe in. Air say. 
<laughs> it is airsay, and I kind of like that term. But overall, I think you're sounding somewhat too much like Morpheus there, Edward. Perhaps we are all in a simulation running on the machine mainframe, and if so, what you say may well be true. Until there's compelling evidence of that, however, I think you have to accept that the laws of thermodynamics are four of the most fundamental natural laws in existence. They're certainly not just some guy's opinion from the olden days. Those laws effectively get scrutinised and confirmed every day by some of the world's smartest people, not you, admittedly, Edward. And our civilised society uses those laws to keep the lights on and make the cars work and everything else every day. Those laws can neither be bent nor broken, but it would be so convenient if they could just a little bit. You need to unplug, Edward. Follow the white rabbit, son. The first law of thermal dynamics is garbage together with the rest of them. Use your common sense. The internal combustion engine is the most inefficient engine ever invented. Here's a pro tip, okay? When you are criticising a fundamental and well understood, widely acknowledged pillar of science, it's a really good idea to be able to spell the subject of your critique but only if you want to be taken seriously. A modern gasoline car is about 30% efficient. A modern diesel might be in the early 40s. A steam locomotive, a really good one from the heyday of steam, up to about 8% efficient. So, fair to say, I think that John B's claim here, quote, internal combustion, most inefficient engine ever, is pretty much total bullshit. Incidentally, you know, internal combustion doesn't stack up too badly in the domain of efficiency generally. Human muscular efficiency, you and me getting off our fat asses and moving without burning hydrocarbons, 20% efficient. Single junction photovoltaic cells commonly used on rooftop arrays, they're about 33% efficient if they're really good ones. So that's on a par with internal combustion. Of course, I, it's fair to say also that that doesn't really matter, that efficiency, because the sunlight's kind of free, until the government figures out how to tax that, and they will. A gas turbine power station, all right, 40% efficient, ballpark. Photosynthesis, ah yes, plants doing their thing, turning sunlight into sugar and cellulose, blah, blah, blah. Two or three percent efficient, which tells me there's no God, because an all-powerful, all-knowing creator would just design a system better than that. Mate, are we sucking on a dry tank yet, uh, nut-wise? No? Oh, good. The first law of thermodynamic. <sighs> it's thermodynamics, you <laughs> fucking genius. Uh, but please, do go on. The floor is yours. The first law of thermodynamic is correct. But this applies only to the quantity of hydrogen and oxygen that are generated by hydrolysis and reused as fuel. There is another factor that most those who never tried it never considered. Really? Because I just checked and uh, it appears that the laws of thermodynamics are universal, which kind of means that they apply everywhere in the universe. The hydrogen entering the combustion chamber at such high temperature could saturate the double bonds of vaporised hydrocarbons of the gasoline, which will reduce the knocking in the engine. <sighs> Petrol, gasoline, tomato, tomato, octane by any other name, it doesn't have any double bonds, mate. I hate to break this to you, but facts are facts. Alkanes have single bonds. That means diesel too. All alkanes have single bonds. All the carbon atoms are already attached either to other carbons or hydrogen by single bonds because that's how this works. You just can't get yourself a PhD in physical chemistry by confidently making shit up, unfortunately. Second comes the oxygen to accelerate the combustion of the total mixture of gasoline and burns it to complete combustion. 
That's an oxidation reduction reaction releasing carbon dioxide and water. Any analyst brings the first law of thermodynamics, looks at one side of the topic. That's almost actual English, so well done there. The new meds are paying off, but it could mean anything or nothing. It's, it's a matter of interpretation, I guess, so let us interpret it. Dear dipshit, when you electrolyze water and make hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, which you should never do under the bonnet of a car because you might blow yourself up, you get less energy than you put into the process because of the second law of thermodynamics. When you add those gases into the combustion chamber, there is only enough extra oxygen to recombine with the exact amount of hydrogen that you just made. This stuff does not have any magic properties. Doing it is dangerous and a complete waste of effort. On complete combustion, okay? Combustion is already complete in modern engines. 98 plus percent complete, anyway. If you measure the pre-catalytic converter exhaust composition of a modern engine at typical road going speeds and loads, there might be 1.5% of unburned hydrocarbons in the exhaust. It's gonna be in that ballpark, but that's about it. So if you target unburned hydrocarbons in your quest to improve the engine efficiency, the best, the very best you can achieve might be 1.5 or 2%-ish lift in efficiency. That's it. So thank you for your interesting take on how this works, Ed. I admire the confidence and the random association of technical sounding words into an assertive thesis that's just right for a PhD at Fucktard University. Well done there. That'll just about do it, I think, for this episode, and because I've had my fill o' nuts, it worries me that these people just walk around among us. My challenge to you, though, the non-nut viewer, is if just 2% of energy is lost in an engine via unburned hydrocarbons, and only about 30% or thereabouts worth of the energy in the fuel actually makes it to the crankshaft to do physical work, where does the other 70-odd percent of the fuel energy actually go? Riddle me that. Let me know in the comments feed below. And thank you for watching. If you get a sec, smash that subscribe button and the bell notification icon too. If you hated this report, beat the thumbs down button in submission. I can never get enough haters. In some ways, I enjoy them even more. They're the nuttiest of nutty commenters, generally. If I get enough interesting answers on this, okay, where does the energy go, that topic, I'll fill in the blanks for you exactly in a report next week on just how good or slash bad your engine is at wasting all that energy and how damn hard it is for the brainiacs who are tasked with this problem to actually fix it. Let's get into that if you're interested. Let me know. Thanks for watching.